peace. And tonight, on tonight's info session, we have as our special guest, uh, guest Colonel, but he is in the reserves, Colonel Grisha Yakubovic. Now, Colonel, your resume reads like something out of an absolute expert's dictionary. Uh, you've served with the IDF for 30 years for the last part as um, the commander of Colgate. And at the moment, you are a businessman. So mm -hmm. do you want to run us through that resume a little bit? Uh, I mean, we hear Colgate and we don't really know what that means. So can you give us a better intro to what you do? Yeah, I'll do it briefly. First of all, good evening from Zgula. It's not Jerusalem. It's uh, actually, according to my expertise, Gaza, West Bank, and what's in between, uh, but I also live in between. So it's yeah. exactly 20 kilometers from Gaza and 20 kilometers from the West Bank. So I'm uh, in between. Uh, if I will have to run to a shelter, you will have to excuse me. Okay. Uh, but I'll press pause and continue. Uh, yeah, it continues. So I joined the IDF at the age of 18, served 30 years at the IDF, started my career as an infantry soldier. So the places that you hear in the news that the IDF is bombing mm -hmm. in Lebanon, I served there as a young soldier, as a medic. And then I uh, completed my training as an officer and I was posted in Gaza during the first Intifada, 1988. I served there under the civil administration. According to the international law, when you conquer a land as a country, as a Western country, this is what expected from you. Mm -hmm. You are obligated to provide services to the people that you conquered. So I served in Gaza uh, since 88 to 94. I was one of the last officers mm -hmm. to leave when we implemented Oslo. And I was uh, some sort of a mayor. So I was actually the last Jewish mayor in Gaza. Uh, I, I gave services to the people that we conquered as, mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, as the IDF. In 67, you know, we won the Six Days War and we conquered the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula till the Suez Canal. And then when Israel implemented the peace agreement with Israel, so we gave everything back except except the Gaza Strip. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to be honest, uh, after 80 day, 18 days of war that Anwar Sadat, the, Palestine, the uh, Egyptian uh, president that did that peace with us, was very, very smart. He knew that Gaza should stay uh, not at his territory. Uh, and then uh, uh, I'm also, by the way, the only IDF officer that was honored by a Palestinian family. There is a kid in Gaza named Grisha, named after me. It's a, it's a, it's an honor given by family from Gaza. Uh, yes, I know I was an occupier, but I also did some friends, as you know, as people to people, as human beings. Uh, I used to visit him once a year, escorted by, I don't know, maybe the next Palestinian president, Dahlan, if and when he will be allowed to uh, go back, to come back. Let's see how will the reality look like in Gaza after the war will, uh, will end. Uh, and then my entire career looked like Gaza, West Bank, Gaza, West Bank, Gaza, West Bank, Gaza, West Bank, and then uh, Brussels, New York, uh, Egypt negotiations with you know who, the ones that we are fighting right now. We will have time I will enter to those details. Uh, so I made a lot of uh, connections, friends in Gaza, a lot of connections and friends in the West Bank, uh, all over the world. I served under the Minister of Defense, direct uh, command. Uh, it means when it comes to the $30 million brought by uh, the, Qatar, the Qatari ambassador, mm -hmm. uh, 30 million, uh, actually the first, never mind. Uh, I was also responsible on those things sometimes. Um, so actually, I know Gaza well, pretty well. I know the West Bank pretty mm -hmm. well. I know uh, the countries around us pretty well. I work with the international community. So I have a three-dimensional picture on the mm -hmm. reality in the Gaza Strip, or as people refer to and say the occupied territories, OK? Uh, or we would, can say the West Bank. Uh, I'm not here to judge, okay? Each one of the people who watch us can decide what they prefer to call those places. 
uh, I will be talking about what I know, the reality on the ground, because I think there are boots on the ground, underground, and in the air. So I also know the Gaza Strip in three-dimensional picture. Uh, I retired in 2016 as a full colonel. Uh, I was the head of the civil department at COGAT, the coordination of government activities in the territories. So my expertise was the economy of the Gaza mm -hmm. West Bank and the connections with Israel, infrastructure, Gaza, West Bank, and also the connections also with Egypt and Jordan and the international. And of course, I was also dealing with the international community. Uh, I'm talking about all the embassies, all the consulates and all the GOs and NGOs. Okay, I'm talking about hundreds of uh, people mm -hmm. from all over the world dealing with the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. All the things that you've heard, Area C, Area B, the Gaza Strip, the border, disengagement, uh, money, uh, ideology, uh, infrastructure, water, electricity. Uh, I think that you that we we came together at one of the tours else a few yes. years ago. And yes. I think it was the Gaza envelope. Yes. And yes. I, uh, we, we we saw some of the things. Uh, so 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 this is the meaning of 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 Koga, okay? Actually, coordinating with the PA, uh, with the Arab world, with the international community to help Palestinians, okay? Mm -hmm. Create a stable reality uh, to lead civil coordination and security coordination. Mm -hmm. So the political levels in Israel and uh, the Palestinian Authority or Hamas will be on a very stable ground so they will be able to move from there to i don't know implement uh, any deals any political decisions any policy mm -hmm. issues uh, for example protective ad 2014 i saved mm -hmm. 5000 millions only by those mm -hmm. coalitions okay as an example wow uh, so, so uh, that's that's Koga, that's civil administration. It's those issues. Would you like to move from here? How do you yes, want to, um, you want? I would like to ask a question or two from the resume, if that's okay. No problem. Now, firstly, you mentioned that you were stationed in Gaza from 88, 1988 to 1994. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the reality of that and what was happening in Gaza back then? Who ruled? And what happened after 1994, you mentioned that the aim was to make a stable reality for the Palestinian people. However, I remember after the tour we did of the Gaza envelope, the one thing, my takeaway from that was, this is not a stable reality. And it is such a complex issue with so many fingers in so many pies that I don't think anybody can get a comprehensive or a bird's eye view of what is going on here. So can you help us unpack this? Can you help us make sense of this? I hope I can. Uh, I was sure that you're going to ask me about me being a kid. Because as a kid, I've been in Gaza. <laughs> I lived in Netivot. It's a small town near Gaza. And I studied in a very orthodox school you know, with the kippah and all those Jewish uh, symbols. And I used to catch a Palestinian taxi from Gaza, entering to the market in the center of Gaza, you know, buying, I don't know, vegetables or whatever. And that was the, that was the reality of the Israeli occupation in Gaza. Okay, so I understood your question. Let me, let me clarify. It. The Gaza Strip was Egypt until 1967. Okay, it was not Israel. No Palestinians were allowed to be teachers. No Palestinians were allowed to be doctors. No Palestinians were allowed to hold any uh, any position at the government because the only government, the only officials were the Egyptians. Israel brought progress. Yes, I know we conquered the Gaza Strip. Yes, okay. we were the occupiers. Yes, okay, uh, but we also brought progress to Gaza. Schools, universities, hospitals, doctors workers in Israel, okay? Actually, the whole reality in Gaza was changed because they suddenly, uh, you know, saw something else that the Egyptians did not show it to them. Mm -hmm. They connected the Gaza Strip to electricity. Uh, they, they, they were not connected to electricity until then. Let's not forget that. 
so the whole reality was changed in the Gaza Strip. They started to live uh, in uh, being neighbors to a Western country, to a democracy. Mm-hmm. Okay, they never knew uh, mm-hmm. nothing. And then we impl- we built the civil administration, and it was our obligation to provide services to the people that we conquered. Uh, I cannot tell you that we were uh, the best of the best. Okay, we also did a lot of mistakes, like any regime, like any government, like any Western government that conquered, that colonized, that uh, uh, operated the Brit- uh, a mandate. Okay, the French mandate in uh, Lebanon, the British mandate in Israel. They were brilliant. They were perfect. They did everything by by the book. Mm-hmm. No, mistakes, okay? So we also made mistakes. Uh, and the first intifada started. The first intifada in the mm-hmm. Gaza and in the West Bank. You know, riots. Uh, we say in Hebrew, balagan. Okay. Uh, and then because of the second intifada, it was one of the uh, one of the uh, major issues that motivated both sides to reach to some arrangement so we've created uh, this uh, peace process with Yasser Arafat called the Oslo uh, Accord okay Gaza and Jericho first so we gave the I gave the keys of Gaza to Yasser Arafat people in 1994 okay uh, they entered the Gaza Strip we evacuated all the city except the settlements in the northern part of the Gaza Strip three in uh, Gush Katif in the center of the area of Yunus and Rafa, and another two isolated ones, Netzarim and Morag. And that was the reality since 1994 in Gaza. Then we implemented the second uh, step of Oslo, 96, 95 in the West Bank. We created areas A, B, C. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Palestinian Authority took responsibility on those uh, cities in the West Bank. And we led a civil coordination and security coordination with the PA, okay? Mm-hmm. Palestinian Authority. When I say civil coordination, it means we help them to build their economy. Okay, mm-hmm. we led together projects. We dealt with electricity. We dealt with water. With economy. Uh, and when it co- when when it comes to security coordination, it means we shared intelligence together. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think that I don't have to explain what is the meaning of that. Uh, you can read it in between the lines and understand what is the meaning of sharing intelligence. This process was supposed to last five years. During those five years, we were supposed to negotiate about the five major big issues. Uh, the future of Area C, the holy places, the holy basin in Jerusalem, uh, the right of return, the question of refugees, and the question of borders. Okay, where will be the borders of the two-state solution? And at the end of those five years, to reach to maybe the permanent solution, the two-state solution, and instead of a two-state solution, what we got is the second intifada. Okay, it means uh, the same Palestinian Authority where I trusted my life. Okay, with them, they drove me to visit young Grisha in Gaza. They were the ones who betrayed us, and. Uh, you know, used the same weapon that we allowed them to bring for law and order in area A and B against us eventually. More than 1,000 Israelis were killed, murdered by suiciders inside Israel, in the West Bank, in Gaza. It was a long time ago. Uh, it was the second intifada from September 2000 to 2005. More than 1,000 Israelis were killed. This is the main reason why Israel built the security fence around mm-hmm. the West Bank. Uh, some people will say this is an apartheid wall, and others will say this is illegal, and others will say, ah, again, I'm not here to judge, okay? I'm just saying Israel built security fence to contain terror inside the West Bank, okay? Mm-hmm. So terrorists will not be able to cross the Green Line and kill mm-hmm. our people, as simple as it sounds. And we kept the modus operandi very simple. The terror is contained, and the IDF and the Shin Bet Israeli Secret Service can move in and out freely, arrest whoever we need to arrest. If the Palestinian Authority, with security coordination, do the job, it's okay, excellent, they will do a great job. And if not, we will enter and do that. Actually, we helped the Palestinian Authority by doing those things. It's to make them, uh, or, or it's they avoid from embarrassment. It's like, you know, people call them collaborators, how can you arrest our people, etc. Et 
Uh, so the second intifada lasted till 2005. In 2001, this is when Hamas started to launch rockets right. into Israel. The first motor shell was launched from Gaza to Zderot. I used to live there, by the way. Uh, and since then, they launched until today, I think, more than 50,000 rockets. Okay? Just, again, 50,000 rockets. Mm -hmm. I won't ask you a question. What would your government do in any country that you live if somebody will launch 50,000 rockets trying to kill your parents or your daughter? Right. Okay? Right. That was our reality. Mahmoud Abbas uh, was elected after Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat, the Palestinian leader, he is the one that... Uh, uh, implemented or actually created the PLO. He is the one that also uh, won a Nobel Prize for Peace. But he is also a terrorist that killed people and called to massacre uh, Jews. Uh, you know, this is, the, this is the world. This is the international community. Uh, some people can be uh, murderers, but also uh, win a Nobel Prize for Peace. We just uh, heard from the UN, the Secretary, also saying that uh, there was a vacuum, uh, there was, and, and this is why Hamas did what they did, okay? Uh, I don't have even the right words to say about such a statement from the United Nations that actually the main reason that they were created is the Holocaust. And what we actually experienced, I don't know if you, if you, if, if you heard what he stated. Yes, yes, I read his statement. Would you like uh, to, to, to comment on that for us? Explain to us why is that such an atrocious thing to say? Because this is some of the things that we face, that we have to defend. Because this is actually what gives legitimacy to radicals all over the world. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's anti-Semitism. It's like you are justifying massacre, uh, people who are subhumans, who butchered, chopped heads of babies, raped, murdered uh, 1,400 Israelis in six hours, eight hours. And saying something like that, it's just, you know, it's justifying it. So if you as the UN justify something like that, and then you get money from the United States and you send donations to those people, so what do you expect? If it happened here, it will reach to your countries, it will reach to your cities, it will reach to your neighborhoods, it will reach to your streets, it will reach to your houses. Mm -hmm. And if we will not stop it here, right here and now, unfortunately, you will all have to deal with mm -hmm. uh, And I hope that you will never, never, ever deal with something like that. Uh, as the man who was on the border with Gaza and who saw everything develop, there are accusations that the current situation in Gaza and the suffering and the oppression was the reason for this massacre. You know you were there. What can you say to that? Do you want me to be polite or unpolite? We are live, right? Uh, you know what? Let me let me let me let me uh, explain the facts. Okay, mm -hmm. let me talk about facts. Okay? I will be uh, I will be me if you don't mind. The Gaza Strip. Uh, let's go back to 2005. Okay, mm -hmm. the state of Israel, Ariel Sharon, Sharon, the Prime Minister, decided to disengage from the Gaza Strip. So Israel evacuated all the settlements from the Gaza Strip. It means since 2005, there are zero, zero Jews settlements, Israelis inside Gaza, except the ones that they kidnapped, okay? Uh, because of the fact that we had to deal with terror, okay? Israel uh, built a fence around the Gaza Strip with uh, soldiers, cameras, uh, you know, observations. Uh, you know, we needed to keep our security. And uh, the border of the Gaza Strip with Israel is six kilometers in the, in the north and 45 kilometers in the east, okay? 
uh, with the pedestrian crossing in the north, the Erez pedestrian crossing, and in the south, the triangle border between Gaza, Egypt, and Israel. Another crossing, a commercial crossing, with an ability uh, to provide services to 1,000 trucks a day that brought goods from Gaza to Israel. Okay, But there were also 14 kilometers of a border that it was between Hamas, Gaza, and Egypt, mm -hmm. without us being there. Okay. Right. So whoever wanted to fly to Europe, to Brussels, to the United States, to Australia, to Turkey, okay, it just took a taxi from the Rafah crossing and uh, drove to El Arish. From El Arish, he took an airplane and flew. Okay, nobody stopped him. We were not there to stop, to check, mm -hmm. to see. To it was Egyptian decision. Okay, not ours. Right. Israel supplied electricity by 10 lines until October 8. Israel supplied electricity mm -hmm. to the Gaza Strip by 8 lines, 45% of the consumption. The rest they got from a power plant that they built in Gaza. You know what else? El ask me a question. How do you know they have a power plant? Please ask me. Grisha, how on earth do you know that they have a power plant there in Gaza? In 96, else, I helped them to build it. So they have a power plant with four turbines that the Siemens, the, the company Siemens, brought it. I escorted them personally from Haifa to Gaza. And actually, it, if, they, if, if it will be fully operated, they can produce the same amount of electricity that we supply from Israel. Okay? Uh, Egypt also supplies electricity to the Gaza Strip, only one line, something like 5% of the consumption. And since then, and until last uh, actually Saturday, October 7th, the people of Gaza uh, had something like 8 to 12 hours of electricity a day. Okay? Why? It depends because it was not enough. Okay? Uh, why? It's a good question. Why? Uh, we supplied, do you know who paid for what we supplied to Gaza? Do you have a guess? Do you want to guess? Israel? No. Europe. Hmm. Oh, come on. The PA? The Palestinian Authority. Of course. We paid for what we supplied to Gaza. Now, when we wanted to add more, because we understood, and maybe I will surprise some of your audience, Gaza, there was a UN report. Google it, okay? Me, while we are talking, Google it. Gaza 2020. It was a, a report since 2012, mm -hmm. I think, that the Gaza Strip, uh, 2.1 million people are about to be left without a drop of water. Now, everybody knew about it, okay? We knew about it, the PA knew about it, the World Bank knew about it, the UN knew about it, okay? Even you knew about it. I told you that. Yes, long time ago. I remember no, this. And yet, they did nothing. They did nothing to solve that, okay? I want to I wanna, I wanna explain that, if you don't mind. So Israel supplied electricity by 10 lines, 45% of the consumption, and Israel also supplied water to the Gaza Strip. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, yes, some of our politicians sometimes say nonsense, okay? Like, who needed to declare we are going to pull the siege on Gaza? Why? Like, do it. Uh, but it's not really a siege. I want to be clear about it, okay? Because what we supplied only 12% of the water consumption to Gaza, mm -hmm. the rest came from the aquifer. Now, the rest came from the aquifer. So what we actually stopped is only 12%. Mm -hmm. Okay? I now, remember the problem that. Gaza, Please explain. I will, yeah, I'm going to explain that. The aquifer in Gaza is about to collapse. Okay? During the year, if you use too much, okay, and you do not invest money in uh, keeping the aquifer, treating the aquifer, mm -hmm. making sure that it will not be polluted, okay? To do that, you need to invest a lot of money, okay? So the PA invested nothing because they uh, relied on the international community. Hamas also had millions of dollars, I will explain how, and they did nothing. So the aquifer is about to collapse. Mm -hmm. And the easiest thing to do is to blame Israel. Right. Why not? Okay? And who paid for those services? The PA. So when we... When I flew, when I flew to Brussels, okay, personally, during my, um, uh, when I started COVID, okay, mm -hmm. and I asked for half a million dollars donation from the EU Parliament, 
Uh, they said, yes, why not? But uh, please, if you want us to give the money to Gaza and to build another desalination plant, you need to make sure that you will solve the energy problems to Gaza. And to do that, we needed the PA. Okay? And we told the PA, guys, you need to be with us. We need to solve the energy problems. And they asked me, okay, personally, okay, let's say that we will be there and help you. And who will pay for the electricity that, we are go- that you are going to add? I said, guys, you, of course, okay? And they, uh, now I'm going to be unpolite, they showed me a finger, but not this one, okay? <laughs> Sorry for being rude. Uh, so actually, to add more, the PEA refused to pay, and I want to explain why, okay? In 2005, we disengaged from the Gaza Strip. In 2006, there were elections. Hamas won the elections because of them winning the elections to the, uh, not to the presidency, okay? It's uh, to the some sort of a parliament. Uh, they had to create a unity government. So Mahmoud Abbas created a unity government, Hamas and Fatah together. <laughs> we stopped coordination with such a government because how can we talk to Hamas? It's a terror entity. Okay, it's impossible. Nobody from the Western world is allowed uh, to be in touch with a terror entity. <laughs> now we are not the Western world. We are part of the Western world, but this is a terror entity that, uh, that is close to us, okay? And it's, a, it's, it's our backyard. It's not somewhere in the Middle East. It's our backyard, okay? So the border between Gaza and where you traveled with me, uh, it was not the border that I showed you between, you know, Italy and Switzerland, okay? Or uh, Brazil and Den Haag. This is the border between a Western democracy and a terror entity. Mm-hmm. Why? Because Hamas was so disappointed from what they got from Mahmoud Abbas in 2006. They said, no way we are going to get that. Uh, you know, they played the game, the deception again. Okay. They are masters of deception. And they led a coup in Gaza in June 2007. They conquered the Gaza Strip from the unity government. Fatah officials ran to the borders. We saved their lives. 300 of them were captured by Hamas and executed. Okay, they tied their hands at the back, brought them to high school buildings that we bombed, uh, shot them in the knees, and threw them down. By the way, while we are talking to the ones who hear us, you can Google it. Okay, June 2007, the coup in Gaza. Okay, it's all there. Uh, and since then, we are facing two Palestinian entities. Mm-hmm. So if we all had a dream about a two-state solution, our reality was a three-state solution from June 2007. Uh, Hamas state in the Gaza Strip, Hamastan, and Fatah state in the West Bank, Fatah becoming now Fatahstan. Okay? Why? Why I'm saying Fatahstan? Okay? Uh, it's a nickname to, uh, to terrorists, if I may say so. Uh, Hamas in Gaza terror entity. Uh, we had uh, four rounds of escalation with them. Uh, 2008, this led 2012, pillar of defense, 2014, protective edge, May 2021, climbing of the walls. In between, there were rounds of escalations, you know, the round in between the rounds. When I say a round in between the round, it means four days or five days of 100 rockets a day, okay? Right. That's the meaning of what I'm saying. And we had also three rounds of escalation with Pidge, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Uh, that Hamas did nothing. Uh, and uh, after each one of those rounds of escalation, we negotiated. There was a ceasefire and they had demands. We uh, uh, implemented some of those demands. We did that. They did that. But eventually, this is the mistake. Because the moment you say, as a Western entity, mm-hmm. yes, there is a ceasefire. Yes, we are negotiating, not directly, through mediators. Yes, we will, uh, I don't know, implement some of their demands. Actually, you are giving legitimacy to a terror entity. Mm-hmm. It means we accept them, okay? We, leg- le- we legitimize them, okay? As an entity, yes, as a sovereign entity responsible on Gaza. And when somebody launched a rocket from Gaza, we bombed Hamas because we said you are responsible. Mm-hmm. But it's actually legitimizing them. Mm-hmm. And slide by slide, they uh, came closer and closer until they built <clears throat> posts on the border. 
with their flags, with the mm-hmm. people who got, you know, uh, managing the Gaza Strip and also uh, having demands. And uh, after each round, when you negotiate mm-hmm. and you apply and you do and you give, it means they've created an equation. Okay, and the equation is very simple. If you want to gain something from the enemy, and we are the enemy, use power, use rockets, mm-hmm. use tunnels, terrorists. Okay, and the moment you accept that and you give something in exchange, you pour content into their equation, and this is Israel's biggest mistake. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> After Garden of the Walls, May 2021, Israel allowed to 17,000 workers to work in Israel. Okay, mm-hmm. so we do it. Okay, uh, the Erez Pedestrian Crossing allowed 17,000 workers to work on a daily basis in Israel, making millions of dollars. I will calculate. I will calculate it with you in a minute. Okay, a crossing between Israel and Gaza with 1,000 trucks a day. Okay, now. Uh, who is the sovereign entity in Gaza? Just remind me. Hamas. Okay, so in who taxes whatever enters to Gaza? The Palestinian yeah. Authority. No, 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 no. Hamas. Hamas. Hamas are taxing whatever enters to Gaza. Okay, so let's talk about numbers. Okay, from Karen Shalom only. Okay, and I will give you only one example that this is, it used to be my mm-hmm. expertise for five years. I was the manager of the Palestinian market at the biggest cement company in Israel. Okay, I completed my contract, I built the market as the company wanted, mm-hmm. and I sold 1.1 million tons of cement to my clients in Gaza and in the West Bank. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, I had an office in Bitunia in Ramallah, you know where is that, you've been there. I worked with the Palestinian teams, with Palestinian cars. Everybody knew me. Everybody know me. Okay, I'm a well-known personality in the West Bank, at the business community. I'm also well-known in Gaza by the generation that are uh, my age and above. Okay, the old members being the mayor. Usually, you know, the new tours that I planned, but they were they, were, they were all canceled. Is usually I would bring the bus to the Arab Palestinian crossing, and I would let the people meet Palestinian workers. Okay, who are coming back to work. And I did it something like 20 times and something like 16 times, some of the workers recognized me. They told me, Grisha, I remember you. You've been the mayor. You did that. You did that. You, did that. you helped me. Or I don't know. You entered to my house whatever, in the middle of the night. Never mind. Uh, but it was, unique. it was a unique experience that people actually could talk to Gaza and to ask them, what is the reality there? And they were really happy to work in Israel. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, we as ministers, because we vote in the Western way, it's like if 17,000 workers enter to work to Israel, it means 17,000 families will enjoy from a wonderful salary, okay? Right. You know what's the average salary in Israel if you are lucky, if you if you are one of those 17,000? No, 450 shekels. Perfect. It's uh, $180 a day. A day? Wow. A day, yes. Do you know what is the average salary in Gaza until October 7th, okay? If you were lucky to get a job, 25 shekels. Do you understand the difference? Right. Okay. Let's calculate it. 17,000 workers. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to open my calculator. Okay. 17,000 workers making 450 shekels a day. It's 7.6 million shekels a day. Okay. Let's make it five days a week. Okay. It's 38 million shekels a week. Let's make it four weeks a month. Okay. It's 153 million shekels a month entering to Gaza from Israel. Let's make it a year. It's 12 months. It's 1.8 billion shekels a month. Okay. Let's translate it to dollars, 3.8. It's half a billion dollar every year entering to Gaza from Israeli salaries. And who is taxing those salaries? Hamas. Hamas. And who is responsible on the economy in Gaza? Hamas. But who is actually providing jobs or jobs to Gazans? So the economy, uh, you know, the wheels of economy, Israel. Actually, we are helping our enemies to uh, take the burden out of their shoulders. Okay, so people will do by creating jobs for those people because you know we said if seventeen thousand families will be happy getting those permits, getting so much money. So we are helping 17,000 families. And that's big money 
for Gazans. Yeah. And it's also to send a light, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a light at the end of the tunnel and showing the people that this is not a train coming to crash into them. It's really, let's, you know, it's like hope for those people that something can be changed in the future. But actually, we played to the hands of Hamas by doing that because we also found some of the terrorists that we killed in Israel with uh, permits that they got from Israel. It means they entered to work in Israel and actually were used as spies. Oh. They knew exactly where everything is located, how many people guard the gates, how you open the gate, where is the uh, web, where do you store the weapons, uh, where is the dining room? How do you think they knew that? Oh my goodness. Okay. This is from Kerem Shalom, from Kerem Shalom, 1,000 trucks, okay? I sold 1,000 tons of cement a day to Gaza. And who taxes, who taxed those, this, this, the 1,000 tons? Hamas. Now, please, let's do it again. You know that, Grisha. Please, yes. Ask me again. Grisha, how do you know that? Grisha, how do you know this? My clients in Gaza sent me the receipts, okay? After I sold the cement, and in the receipt, it was written eight shekels per a ton that they paid to Hamas. Now, 1,000 tons, eight shekels a day, uh, per a ton, okay? You can just calculate the money. Yeah. Goes to Hamas. And it's only the cement. What about the flour, the water, the sugar, the rice, the... Okay, big money. But this is not the end. Hamas and Egypt decided that 65% of the good, goods that will be imported to Gaza will come through Egypt. 65% mm -hmm. of the goods to Gaza from Egypt. Uh, uh, there is a company called Abna Esina, the Sons of Sinai. The CEO is a Sisi's son. Okay, and from those goods that Hamas taxed, they made an income of seven hundred million dollars a year, directly to their pockets. Okay, mm -hmm. so money from the workers, money from Kerem Shalom, money coming from Egypt, uh, thirty million dollars a month that El Imadi, the Qatari ambassador, uh, by the Israeli permission. Okay brought to Gaza since 2014, okay? Calculate 30 million per one month since 2014. That's big, big money. So Could where... they, they solve the energy problems in Gaza? Yes. Could they solve the water problem in Gaza? Yes. Could they build clinics in Gaza? Yes. Could they build schools in Gaza? Yes. Could they uh, build industrial zones in Gaza? Yes. Could they provide, I don't know, social environment to the people of Gaza? Yes, but they preferred to invest all that money in building tunnels, rockets, trainings, drones, RPGs, hand grenades, TNT, okay? And they didn't care, or they cared, but somebody else was doing the job for them. People like, uh, not like you, you live in Israel, but uh, people who live all over the world, who donate to international organizations, who donate to the UN, who pay taxes to the UN, they are the ones who are actually supporting terror in Gaza. Because if Hamas will launch a rocket from a school, okay, or from, from a clinic, and we will have to destroy this clinic because a rocket was mm -hmm. launched from there, uh, who will reconstruct and build it? The UN? It's not their money. They know that somebody else will do it for them. So actually, I'm sorry to say that, and to you and to your audience and to me, okay, we all supported terror in a way. And yes, there are people in Gaza, and they are poor people, and I love some of them. I have best my I have good friends in Gaza. I have nothing against the people of Gaza. Uh, but if you are born into such a reality mm -hmm. in Gaza, okay. And you are a, you are under the system of Hamas, okay? You are educated since kindergarten to hate, to uh, kill, to kidnap, okay? To be cruel. So uh, there are a million people in Gaza. Let's say I think 1.9. I will tell you why because I know that uh, 200,000 fled Gaza, okay? Through Egypt and then through the sea and then Europe and other in the world in peace. Uh, so let's say uh, 1.9 million people, okay, in Gaza. Uh, there are something like 1 million people in Gaza between the age of 0 and 18. Okay, mm -hmm. this is not 
this is not my data. I think this is UN data. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, Hamas is in control since 2007. It's 16 years. So the majority of the kids were actually born into this mm-hmm. reality of hating, of incitement, of killing, of and, and this is why they were so cruel, I think. Okay. Now let's uh, let's not uh, let's not skip about the round of escalation. They they all lost mm-hmm. lost people there. Okay. But we had to react because we were attacked. Okay. Right. But they could change. They could change it. Instead of changing it, they channeled all the hate. They channeled all the efforts to murder, kill, slaughter, butcher. Okay. And they prepared themselves and they had all the tools. So this plan was made, uh, what we understand, for at least two years they planned it. Okay. And this is a failure in Israel, a huge failure. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it mm-hmm. because this is some, something that will be different. different. Yes. No, no, it's not that I'm afraid to deal with that. Okay. I have my own opinion mm-hmm. about it. I know it's exactly uh, uh, who are the people that I think that I will blame in the future and what they should do. But this is not the time. Okay, we mm-hmm. are at war and now we will back our leaders. We will back mm-hmm. the IDF. But we have only one goal to defeat terror. Okay, not only that. So October 7th, 2,500 terrorists invaded Israel using some weaknesses, deception. They killed more than 1,400 uh, Israelis. Uh, women, kids, older people, soldiers, uh, by brutality that I've never, ever, ever thought. I will just uh, share with you uh, one of the things, okay, that uh, our Minister of Foreign Affairs recorded and that the UN Secretary will hear it. A guy from Gaza calls his parents. I'm going to, if you want, I can send it to you. Yes. A guy from Gaza that invaded to Israel at one of the kibbutzim, never mind where. And he's using the phone of one of his victims, calling his father and saying, Dad, Dad, I sent you pictures to your WhatsApp. Just look at it. I'm all with blood in my hands and I slaughtered and killed 10 Israelis. And I'm talking from the mobile phone of the woman that I just murdered. And just look at me and be proud of me. Okay? I killed 10 Jews with my hands and the mother and the father say whoa we are so proud of you you are a hero this is exactly what we uh, wanted you to do in the future okay etc etc the sights that i saw the pictures that i saw the brutality it's uh i think that even the nazis did not do something like that and i'm a son of both holocaust survivors my both parents passed away the last year and a half when you came to Israel, and I was mm-hmm. so proud to say my both parents live. I'm the son of a, a Holocaust survivor. My father survived Auschwitz, and you remember how proud I was. I, really I continue. Uh, I had to say goodbye to both of them. They, they they passed away, but from the stories that I heard from my dad, okay, about Auschwitz, they did things worse. It's not only crimes against humanity. It was evil at its peak. How can you kill 40 babies? How can you chop heads of babies? How can you take babies and put them on the laundry uh, robe, okay? As, uh, as, 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 uh, as clothes, okay? And then burn them. How can you rape a woman, 10 to 15 men raped a woman and chopped her organs? Okay, mean by by why why they were raping her? Okay, uh, two kids tied to each other and they used one bullet that would cross the two heads, burning people alive. Okay, I think it's enough. And uh, because of that, Israel had to stabilize the line and then to move from defense to attack. And what you see now for the last eighteen days, Israel is attacking the devil in Gaza. Okay, mm-hmm. not the we asked the people of the northern part of Gaza to move to the southern part of Gaza. Uh, we sent flyers from the airplanes, SMSs, WhatsApp messages in Arabic, in English, in any language to avoid from innocent people to get killed. Unfortunately, Hamas again and again and again using their own people as human shields. Unfortunately, Hamas will continue with the industry of lies as Al-Ahli Hospital and Mahamadani. 
quickly. And now, 500 people were killed. Uh, you know else? I've been personally in that hospital at least 100 times. First, you know, the parking that they showed, mm -hmm. it cannot be 400 people. It's so small. Okay, I've been there. I know the hospitals, I know the churches, I know the doctors, because personally, not once, not twice, 100 times. Okay? So, and, and you know what surprised me, what hit me, not surprised, it's shock. How can international famous mm -hmm. respect media accept it as a fact just like that? I know. Why? I know. You know what I think? It's because we can't deal with the fact that such evil exists. We cannot comprehend that such evil exists, and therefore it cannot be true. We will not, the, we will um, not let this evil reach to you guys. And this is our mission now. This is what, what we stand for. What happens now, Grisha? What happens now? First of all, I want to distinguish. We call the people of Gaza, 700, 800,000 people to move to the south. And aid will be there. Uh, not everything, of course, but aid will be there. Uh, because we are fighting a very, very cruel enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we will we will implement okay the missions. Uh, uh, eventually, uh, the IDF will be inside Gaza, boots on the ground, because the only way to kill them one by one, I'm talking about the ones who are responsible for the massacre, okay? I'm talking about terrorists, I'm talking about people who murdered, butchered. Those are the ones that uh, their destiny is one, okay? One, it's a death penalty. And nothing less than, there's nothing else that you can do with people like that. And we captured a few hundreds of those terrorists. We investigate them. I think that you will see as they go through more, uh, more evidences. We found on their bodies GoPro cameras, and mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, the IDF spokesman showed in a closed hall or for only 100 journalists, not more. Okay, uh, the horrifying, the, hor the, 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 the horrible movies that were taken by them. It's like they came in purpose to, to, to take pictures of, of the butchery. Okay, and they all came out of there in shock. Okay. Only then they understood. And we will not publish those videos uh, uh, to the mm -hmm. whole world. It's, uh, it's not who we are. This yeah. is not our culture. This is not our, it's, it's, it's against our religion, by the way, if you know. Yeah. yeah. Respect the dead. Uh, mm -hmm. And we have uh, 222 people who were kidnapped into Gaza. I'm talking about children from the age of six months to uh, 90. Uh, some of them are Holocaust survivors. They have to go through that again. Unfortunately, Hamas uh, started a process, you know, psychological mind war of releasing mm -hmm. two every because they want to make sure that they will extend uh, the fire management. So we will also think twice before entering to Gaza. It's a tool mm -hmm. that they offer us. I already wrote, uh, I think last week, Hamas's strategy. I'm going to publish it. Uh, I hope next week. I know exactly how they work. They have six parallel axes of strategy. Uh, one of them is uh, and I I think that Israel did a mistake again okay but we cannot we cannot uh, not uh, listen or, or uh, adopt the recommendations of our allies uh, we are also obligated to the international law so aid will enter from Rafah to the people in the southern part of Gaza uh, I think it's already four times that 20 trucks entered. And uh, the Air Force continues bombing Gaza, the Gaza Strip. And eventually we will enter to the Gaza Strip. We will try to do whatever we can to release the innocent civilians that were kidnapped by Hamas into Gaza. And uh, we will continue with the pressure to kill uh, all the terrorists. All the terrorists, all the leaders who are responsible to this, uh, I don't know, slaughter, to this evil that happened on October 7th. Uh, the humanitarian issue in Gaza is, uh, is an issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things that it's one of my expertise. This is what I did in the past. So uh, I, I, I know something about humanitarian aid and crisis. 
So there are three levels of humanitarian uh, situations, okay? One is a distress situation, mm -hmm. two is a crisis, and three is a disaster, okay? So now, 18 days in a war, we are at the top bar of the first situation, okay? It means distress. I'm not saying mm -hmm. it's not difficult in Gaza. I'm not saying that the people are not suffering, okay? I'm not saying that, okay? I'm just saying that this is not a crisis yet. And I hope that with the aid that will enter from Egypt, and I hope that if Hamas will think about their people and not sacrifice them, then we can avoid from reaching to the next level of crisis or disaster. But it's in their hands. They can release the prisoners in a minute and we will solve the problem. It's in their hands. It's their responsibility. They brought it on the heads of the people of Gaza. Right. Now, they could, and I told you that, if you remember a few years ago, Gaza could be Hong Kong or Singapore of the Middle East. And instead of that, this is an island or a, or a strip of terror. Worse, worse than ISIS. You know what? To say ISIS on them, it's even a company. Grisha, my last question to you is this. How do you feel you spent almost 30 years close to Gaza. As an Abba, as a Safta, how do you feel? Uh, I decided to put my feelings aside, honestly, okay, because I don't want to be, I don't want to, I don't want to get broken, okay? Yeah. I've seen so many sights in my life, okay? And uh, you know what? Let me let me tell you something that maybe surprise will surprise. I don't know if you, but maybe some of your uh, some of the audience. I worked at Kogat for twenty seven years, okay, as an as a soldier, as a, as an officer. I reached to the highest rank at Kogat, okay, to the level of you know uh, operations, implementation of of missions, okay, and my whole mission, my whole life, my whole career was dedicated to one thing, one thing, help the Palestinians, okay? Uh, you know, to build projects, hospitals, to coordinate, to spread uh, love, uh, to change the educational systems, coordination, civil coordination, meetings. I flew with them to Brussels, to New York. We had whiskey together, beer together. Yes, they drink, so what, okay? And we party together. And I, my best friends today, okay, my best friends today, are from Ramallah. Okay, I want to show you. I'm sitting on my back balcony. Okay, this is my backyard here, exactly here. Okay, exactly here. Uh, two months and a half ago, exactly, my best two friends with their wives spent here the whole evening barbecuing mm -hmm. and we had finished a bottle of whiskey together. Okay, and I don't know what to say after seeing this horror in Gaza. My heart is broken. I don't know what I would do if it was one of my family members, okay? I don't know. It's a... Uh, we had to go in Israel through an earthquake. You need to understand that. For us, mm -hmm. the second Holocaust, but it is mm -hmm. not a Holocaust that happened somewhere in Europe. It's a Holocaust that happened here in Israel. And we will need and we will be forced to fix that. And as fast as possible, we will succeed. We will win. We will win. I can promise you that we will win, not only for us, but also for the free Western democracies in the world. Because if we will not do that, you will have to deal with that back home. And you can see already cities all over the world, in Europe especially, what they have to go through. Just look at what is happening in France, what is happening in Sweden, what is happening in Denmark, in Norway, and the Netherlands. Just look at it. Sorry for being emotional. No, Grisha, this is, this is perfect. I want to tell you that this was not our tragedy, but we were here for it. And we cannot imagine what you're going through, but we are here for it. We did not leave. None of us left and none of us will leave. We are here for it, and we will continue to speak
speak out. That's the only thing that we can do. We can't go to war with you, but on the battlefield of propaganda and on the battlefield of Hasbara, we're here. We're here for you. This is the most important battlefield. And this is, unfortunately, again, we as the government uh, are not part of government, so I'm doing it alone, but the government is also failing. But eventually we will succeed with that, okay? I'm yeah. sure we will succeed. By, by 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 getting you guys helping us and we need your help now because what i see in social media is is terrible no it's terrible, terrible. it's terrible i know thank you grisha thank you for speaking with us thank you for thank speaking you. from the heart you and i will speak again thanks thank you grisha. very much thank you bye-bye everyone have a lovely evening this is Ilza Strauss saying good night from jerusalem <laughs>